know, everyone else is having sex, and... Don't worry, they're not enjoying it. <laughs> it is very hot in that room. The central piece around gay sex is this is prohibited, and it's part of our identity. So what I see is a lot of men um, creating a shared culture, like sex is the central way of connecting in gay culture. It's not, you know, necessarily heart first, it's just, you know, cocks first. And so um, intimacy is not the first thing. So there's a culture already that supports the violation of prohibition. It's our sex has been, we've been denied it and our just our being in general, our sexuality, historically has been criminalized and vilified, and it's been so we've had to protect it, we've had to fight for it, um, and it's also a big turn on for me to to do things that you're not supposed to, and I feel like be, because of my upbringing, gay sex falls into that category altogether, and uh, that's potentially why or oh, one of the reasons that led me to doing porn as if an act of rebellion against just not being allowed to be who I am. So uh, I was just like, let's see about that. The best sex is not civilized. No. Do you agree with that? No, no. <laughs> it's not. It puts us in conflict with our self-image of being good boys, right? Um, it touches on these deep shadowy emotions that like, you know, in real life, right, quote unquote, our jobs, uh, maybe not your jobs, I'm not so sure. You can talk, talk to me about this. But we're not allowed to contact those emotions, right? Mm. If you're at work, you know, like if you're sitting at a desk job, you know, it's like jealousy, contempt, rage, these things have been socialized out of our beings because they're not helpful. What I mean by the best sex is full of this stuff. It's like whenever we're having really hot sex, it's usually some sort of, you know, deep disavowing um, of... The, the civilized self, and it's, I'm in contact with the animal now. Violation of prohibition is at the heart of this entire dilemma because, like, as we're children, we are instructed in what's acceptable, what we're allowed to do, what we're not supposed to do, what's, you know, what's right and wrong, this deeply ingrained idea. But that's also the time in our lives when we're, like, developing this sense of, like, separation from our parents. So we're like trying to differentiate from our families and our parents and those models and claim a sense of agency. Like the entire adolescent arc of our development psychologically is all about how can I be different from them? How can I rebel? How can I like establish like my own sense of self? And that shows up in all kinds of ways, like in teenagers, right? We rebel, we push against the boundaries. So if when we're in that developmental phase of life, which we were, we're also in being ingrained with this idea that sex is wrong, I'm not supposed to do it, I shouldn't touch my private parts, and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. We're starting to get all these uncomfortable feelings around it because we might get caught, so we gotta hide it. I came out as bi when I was 17, uh -huh. so I was never really fully accepted into the either community. Uh -huh. So one community would be like, okay, well, you're basically telling lies about yourself, and it's a stepping stone to go into like, you know, right. being a true gay. Right. And the other one would be like, well, you're just greedy. So it was just like, you know, two counteracting sides and like, you know, trying to find one's place within that whole like dynamic was very difficult. And then also then add to like that cruising, add to that having like, you know, to understand what it means to like, you know, have a partner, but then also cheating a partner because you have other desires. And knowing right. that for me being uh, non-monogamous in later life was actually a better way to, to express my sexuality as opposed to being within like more heteronormative or Mm -hmm. very rigid structures mm -hmm. to actually like you know explore sexuality and stuff because mm -hmm. then someone would always get hurt and I wouldn't know why I'm hurting them in this scenario you're the prohibition for both sides right he's breaking the rules like he'd be like owning that and in, in like kind of an open kind of way mm. this is like here's who I am and this is what I'm doing and you're like you're holding the space that like they're all projecting onto you and that's their own like hang-ups that they're experiencing around yeah, but you take those projections as well and you exactly. kind of internalize that. Exactly.
Cuckold fantasies are like a really hot thing, I think, in the gay community right now. And I think they come from a, they come from a lot of different places. But what I think is really important and what I wanted to highlight in this is not a cuckold scene where someone's being denigrated and someone's like, you know, witnessing their partner being fucked and, and it's about like, you're not good enough and I'm better. It's about bringing honesty into relationship. And that's really hard. Like we have this like fear of being fully seen. It's hard enough to be seen anyway, but to like do that in relationship and really talk about what's called the third. But it means basically anything that's not between me and my partner is called the third. That could be symbolic, right? It could be a conversation about hotness that we think is out there. It could be like an actual person that's the third. It could be, you know, role play. It's bringing in what exists outside of you into a relationship. So um, in that scene, the key is sharing openly and we wanted the perspective to be on the boyfriends, not on the bull. And it's the eye gazing that they're having while this experience is having, we're trying to show and demonstrate for men a way of communicating about our desires and a way of experiencing them in a way that's healthy for us and that can actually strengthen our relationships with other men and people outside of our relationships to bring in and it'd be an experience where we can strengthen the bonds and not be something that like tears us apart or that we do um, you know, on the sly that can wreck our relationships. I got kind of I got addicted to kind of cottaging and like public toilet sex and stuff like that. I didn't have a huge outlet in Aberdeen as a young gay boy. Um, and I literally stumbled across these underground places, literally underground places, um, to have sex with men. And I jumped at the chance and overindulged. <laughs> but I was, I was fully in control. I mean, people might look at it and think, oh my God, he was so young. And trust me, I looked really young as well. Um, but I, it was fully consensual. I kind of stumbled into cruising. Ha. <laughs> when I was like, you know, probably in like, I stumbled into like the toilet and <laughs> found this hole. It, was like a, it wasn't, actually that's how it started, a bush. It wasn't like George Michael. The toilet didn't turn into like a disco place. Um, <laughs> now my experience started off with like, literally like a, um, like uh, being across the road from where I lived and meeting this guy and then going to the bushes with him and that was like really kind of different and then I don't remember how I got into cruising but I remember like there used to be days where I used to like you know take an afternoon right. just to go to like this little triangle I used to call between uh -huh. like Leicester Square, uh -huh. Soho and Carnaby Street. And these will be the free toilets that you can access. Oh, yeah. I remember those. <laughs> <laughs> I heard about those. Those are the when free toilets. Liberty. Something. Yeah. <laughs> when something was boring in one toilet, you just go to the next yeah, toilet. Exactly. It was like a little, like, you know, secret club that nobody knew about, exactly. but actually knew about and never really said anything about because, like, you know, <coughs> it was seen as, like, you know, disgusting behavior, especially right. by, like, you know, people who weren't really aware of so that what was happening and then you go downstairs and then like right. everyone will be like super still until they realize that you're actually one of them and it's okay I can't relax yeah so many I think since the advent of Grindr and various other yes. yeah. online things yeah. it it has killed that side of um, and people love that and there's right. I, d I did it a lot as a teenager as well mm. because it, it was Absolutely. easy access to sex where mm. yes um, whereas I wasn't sure I didn't go out to gay bars or anything yet mm. right when we're experimenting when we're becoming adults and we're creating our sexual identities we're at a f you know it's a formative place in our psyche like we're still internalizing and we I mean we, truthfully we're doing this our entire lives but especially during adolescence and childhood we're still like a sponge absorbing and like creating who we are in the world we're not really sure fully uh, who we are we don't even really solidify that until we have lots of life experience to help us kind of like reflect and realize who we are mm -hmm. so in the process of that when we're exploring all these things as children we're also picking up like you know like what you were just saying like you were afraid whenever you were doing what you were doing mm -hmm. it's wiring in there there's anxiety you're like you know sneaking in public toilets I used to do a ton of that 
when I was in the closet, especially. And it was like always fused with this feeling of like fear that I would get caught, mm. you know, uh, with my wife or with like the grander, you know, people would know that I was gay. Mm. Um, or an anxiousness around getting caught if you're having sex in public, you know, you can get arrested and it's, you're building in these sensations and emotions into our sexuality. Isn't, do you not think though that's part of the appeal of cruising as well? I was gonna say, it is. Is yes. that the possibility, exactly. yeah. the possibility of getting caught? Exactly. Yeah. And that right there, what you're saying is what the violation of prohibition is all about mm. as an erotic template. It's like, I can't be turned on unless I also feel a little guilty about what I'm doing. Yeah. And that's the effect of that internalization that you were what you were saying. A lot of gay men, including myself, their formative sexual experiences were public sex, cruising in parks, um, places where there was a high level of anxiety often because there would be a fear of getting caught or a fear of like maybe I'm not safe and maybe someone's going to hurt me. And um, it speaks to our community, but there's a there's an overturning of anxiety there because it actually, so here's like, let's, if this is your arousal arc and this is your anxiety arc, um, if you become so anxious that it surpasses your ability to be aroused, and obviously that kills your boner and you can't stay aroused, but if you if the anxiousness is there and then you get aroused and you just kind of keep it at bay and you feel safe enough, it can throttle your experience. So a lot of men have these experiences where that's like the most exciting sex for them and they're not really sure why. It's because they're playing with the, the idea of anxiety. And so uh, it, you can actually use that to your benefit once you're aware of that because you can, you and your boyfriend can run around and do things in public and create that kind of atmosphere for yourself. Pissing, for sure. Like, I really, really, really like water sports, and I don't do it enough in my life. <coughs> I mean, I still kind of, like, you know, it's one of these sort of things where, like, I kind of uh, withhold saying it. And I think also, perhaps, like, this idea of, like, pissing yourself comes back from, like, you know, the sort of child, like, child uh, memory or actual, like, you know, yeah, a, a child memory of actually like, you know, wet in the bed or like, you know, not being able to wait to go to the toilet somewhere because you don't want to piss outside. So then you just end up wetting yourself, um, which has happened. <laughs> and um, yeah, I guess like being seen, seeing that as like, you know, that was a wrong thing, you know, wet in the bed and waking up and being like, shit, okay, I've just wet the bed. This is so embarrassing. So I guess there is a sense of humiliation in, in that, but I don't see it as humiliation when I'm doing it. Like, or when somebody else is doing it to me. Like, I don't really, they don't, they don't really, like, connect in that same sort of way. Well, I love the cruising places that are, they are not for cruise. For example, I love to go to a hotels and put the bed in the balcony and just start to fuck in front of everyone. You know, it's not a cruising area, but it's my cruising area. I love also smells. That's very important to me. My man never needs to use deodorant, please. I lie, go to the gym and smell the guys when they are when they are pissing that's driving me crazy yeah you got into trouble at the gym mm. <laughs> <laughs> i just I, I will answer just with that. i i changed the last year three times my gym <laughs> there's certain like i i have sportswear fetishes the one thing i don't have that a lot of people seem to love is kind of exciting situations kind of outdoors or in public and I've just had sex on so many unbelievably uncomfortable porn sets 
that I just want to have sex in a bed. <laughs> it, it, that that really loses um, uh, its its appeal quite quickly when you've had to have sex on on a boat and been so seasick you're throwing up over the side or whatever it whatever absurd situation it's been. trials, one of the accusations that was made against the witches that were being tried was that they would kiss the devil's anus, and it was a sign, this like secret symbol that they were in allegiance with the devil. And when I read that, I felt like, oh my God, like gay men, you know, ass eating is like so, we, we love that. And everything in our sexuality has to do a lot with the ass. And so it's for our culture, um, it's like a symbol of shame and even like you know everybody has you know everyone's like told your kid like you're, it's gross when you poop you got you know your ass is like this big shameful thing and here we are as gay men bringing this shameful place into our sexual practice right so it's like it takes a lot for men to let go of some of those conditioned attitudes around sexuality so the devil's kiss is about um, actually glorifying the ass and putting it in this place of um, exaltation we often see in traditional porn ass eating being like this thing that's done to the submissive in a way it's like he's being really subby this is about you know him it's almost like bringing out the feminine qualities in a man um, in a way that men experience sometimes to be shameful about themselves and the devil's kiss is about the one who's eating his ass is actually the one that's submitting he's like putting his mouth on this man's asshole and it's exalting him it's like you know let me it's almost it's a worshipful act Do you know what I find really interesting that there's like I, I see like people like JP for example or Bishop they're so uh, so kind of sexually liberated and open and I'm like there's an expectation to be the same mm. on me but I I think I carry this 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 notion that sex is prohibited altogether right so like for me to even kind of come out of the regular the the vanilla. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like so impossible sometimes because only just that alone seems like a violation of prohibition. Mm -hmm. Just having sex. If when we were children, mm -hmm. we were curious about sex and if we had perfect parenting and someone to say, this is a beautiful thing and connected with you about it, you wouldn't carry anxiety as much into, you know, like those are the results of these experiences from early on where mm -hmm. it was like I was punished for my first sexual experience. Yeah. I, you know, we internalized that something's wrong here. So the power in this um, violation of prohibition is like the awareness of the obstacles that we're pushing against, like the desires that we're not supposed to have alongside the, um, the, the obstacle itself, you know, that we're going to break through that and have an awareness about it. And then that's like the crux of our experience in violation of prohibition. How is this affecting my life? Like, how am I enjoying my experience? What can I do to deepen my experience? Like, how can I connect with the person that I'm having sex with more deeply? How much more honest can I be with him? You know, about, and that's, that is the spiritual journey. I mean, it really comes down to that. So the obstacles inside us become the new frontier that we push against and the prohibitions that we want to break through.